Okay, let's get started tonight. Please take your seats. I'd like to welcome you to the Computer History Museum in this edition of the CHM Presents Speaker Series. My name is Ike Nassi. I'm a founding trustee of the museum, as well as a former colleague of Bob Bruner's at Apple. I see a lot of new faces in the audience and some people that I've known for a number of years. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, both the new friends and the old friends alike. And, and let me just raise your hand if you ever worked at Apple Computer. Oh my God. Incredible, incredible. Larry Tesler was saying uh, in the reception downstairs that there's tens of thousands of former Apple alumni. Um, anyway, tonight uh, we're proud to welcome Jerry Manick and Bob Bruner with Bill Morgridge uh, as moderator to hear their personal stories from the world of industrial design at Apple Computer. Excuse me, Apple. Change the name. <laughs> Those of you who are familiar with Jerry and Robert know that each of them has designed many things outside of Apple, and the question arises, why focus only on design at Apple? Well, see, we have this book, this, this wonderful book that you can buy downstairs, filled with wonderful photographs, and uh, in fact, you can even get it signed if you haven't already gotten it signed by the authors who are here. Um, the author and uh, photographer, uh, the book is, by, by the way, called Core Memory. It's a survey of the vintage computer featuring machines from the Computer History Museum collection downstairs. So, uh, uh, well, let's see. Okay, I thought we had... Uh, Hmm. Okay, you'll see that there are some fantastic images of Apple products as well as other machines like the ones we have in front over here. And you can see them downstairs in the visible storage display. The photographer is Mark Richards, the author is John Alderman. And you can get your copies uh, personalized downstairs from 8.30 to 9 if you haven't already done so. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to tell you something about the display coming up to, at the Computer History Museum in September. Um, we will be showing a five-ton Victorian computer designed in the early 1800s known as the Babbage Difference Engine. It will be on display in the lobby downstairs. This will be the only uh, showing in the uh, United States. So please uh, be on the lookout for the announcement. It'll be in September. You won't want to miss it. I also want to thank all of our members and supporters who are here with us tonight and invite those who are not yet members to please consider becoming a supporter of the museum. Your help and involvement is what makes it all happen. If you can, it would be great if you could consider joining as a member before the end of our fiscal year, which is at the end of this month. Membership forms are available in the lobby downstairs. And finally, please, turn off your, your trios, your blackberries, and so forth. I tell you, I just got some new pictures of my grandson, and one of them, he's 16 months old, and he's holding a blackberry. I don't know. <laughs> Let me now introduce our moderator, who will in turn introduce the speakers. Award-winning designer Bill Mogridge is a co-founder of IDEO, one of the most successful design firms in the world, and one of the first to integrate the design of software and hardware into the practice of industrial design. He's been a visiting scholar in interaction design at the Royal College of Art in London, a lecturer in design at the London Business School, a member of the steering committee for interaction design of the Inter Interaction Design Institute in Ivrea, Italy, and is currently consulting associate professor in the joint program in design at Stanford University. Bill's career has been in three phases, first as a designer, then as manager of design, and now as a communicator working as a graphic a writer, a graphic designer, and video maker. He is the author of Designing Interactions from MIT Press. Please welcome Bill Mulgridge. Yeah, I think uh, I'd like to start with uh, Jerry Manick. It's, we're sort of doing a, a sequence historically here, and he's going to be telling us about his design for the original Macintosh uh, in 1984. Um, can you turn me up a little bit? Uh, Is that better? Yeah, OK. All right, thank you. Um, so Jerry actually managed to escape the valley in 1985, and he's been living in Vermont ever since. Of course, he gets sucked back here every now and again because you can't really avoid this place for very long. Um, but before that, he trained, uh, he was educated at UCLA and then went to the Stanford product design program um, where he uh, 
had a chance to kind of do that mix of entrepreneurial uh, design, um, trying to understand people and making things work. Um, and uh, then went on to um, work at HP, which of course I think is a habit of everybody who goes through that program, um, and did uh, about 13 or 14 measuring devices. Um, left a little while, went to telesensory, traveled around a bit, um, and uh, then in 76, he started his own company called Manic Comprehensive Design. It had to be pretty comprehensive because he was in an 8 by 20 um, office in Palo Alto. And it's, so you have to be pretty comprehensive if you're such a small space. Um, and he had a chance to work on Apple products, first independently on the Apple II, um, and then joining half-time, half-time being 50 hours a week, um, as employee number 246. Um, went on to um, work, collaborate with uh, Javi Kelly, which is the uh, other half of my company, the David Kelly side, um, from the, the sort of roots of IDEO, um, and collaborated on the Apple III and then um, we're on the Macintosh, and that's what he'll be telling us about uh, this evening. Um, now he has his um, own company again. Um, he's gone back to um, being a consultant, uh, but now in Vermont, and he's teaching uh, design at the University of Vermont. And then Bob Bruner here, um, you know, when I arrived in uh, the Bay Area from London to start my second office, um, GVO was the company in Palo Alto that was really doing some pretty good design work, I thought. They were the competition. Um, and uh, that's where Bob actually got his first experience before he started Lunar Design, which then became a really excellent consulting uh, firm. Um, and they started in 84, so really just at the same time as the Macintosh. Um, and Bob went on to sort of expand his reputation, getting more and more awards in all sorts of different design areas, and then uh, joined Apple um, and uh, became the guy in charge of the industrial design team at Apple for the period when Steve Jobs wasn't around. So that was like sort of 89 to 96. Um, and then he went to Pentagram, which is an interesting design partnership. There's a group of partners who sort of have a practice each and they share a lot of the uh, advantages of being collegial and sharing expenses and so on. So working in San Francisco. Um, just recently, he's decided to break away from that and do something completely new. And this is all due to a barbecue. Because <laughs> he designed this barbecue for a new start company called Fuego um, with an Italian entrepreneur from Panova. And they were so excited about doing the product that they just thought he's got to kind of lead the company, be the CEO, and help the uh, entrepreneur from Padua make it happen. So he's now started his own um, independent company, again, called Ammunition, with offices in San Francisco and in Padua, although I think officially he doesn't start until July the 1st. So we can't be quite sure whether he's a pentagram man or an ammunition man. <laughs> So let me uh, ask uh, Jerry then to give us the start and tell us about the Macintosh. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear? No, we need to come up a little. How's that? Great. Uh, I'm going to do our hosts one, one better. Who was at Apple from 1977 through 1984? Raise your hand. All right. Great. Um, I'd like to say, too, that I'm, I'm really, truly humbled by being on the same podium here with these two designers. Uh, and as a measure of that, these are some instruments that Bob brought from his office, from his archives. I have that one little product over there. And if you doubled the number of products, you'd, you'd have just a small fraction of what these two great designers have done. So thank you guys uh, for inviting me. I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, I think it's important to talk about the Stanford Design Program uh, to give you a little bit of background on what that program is all about and how it differs from a lot of industrial design programs in the country, which shaped a lot of, of my contribution to Apple. I'm then going to talk about not about the Apple, uh, the Macintosh, but about the Apple III which uh, hardly ever gets mentioned. And I think there's some, some interesting insights in that. Uh, they ask us to talk about, in hindsight, what w would we have done differently? And I want to share with you something that I haven't talked about ever before for the Apple III. Uh, 
And then uh, they ask us to talk about lasting values, and I have about four, four or five lasting values that I'd like to pass on. So uh, let me get my computer up here and running. Did somebody flip? No, that's not it. <laughs> Good heavens, that's not it. <laughs> Do we flip the switch up here? This always happens at a, at a technical discussion. So it looks like you we got practiced something. this for hours, about you know, 45 minutes ago. It looks ago. like you got something now, Jerry. There we go. Uh, maybe we could kill some light so people could see that. Stanford Design Program uh, is unique in that it stresses the technical side as, as well as the aesthetic side, and it values them equally. So we were taught to design from the inside out, as a mechanical engineer would, and then turn around and design from the outside in, as a, as a traditional industrial designer would design. And then we were taught to iterate as many times as we could. Uh, the example of this, uh, Bob McKim on the left, he was head of the program when I was there at Stanford, very talented designer and educator. Whoa. Well, the slides are not advancing. Help. <laughs> uh, I, I swear this worked 20 minutes ago. I'm trying to advance. How about just hitting the space bar? Let's, okay. Is that the one you wanted? No. We're getting back to it. Okay. Good. Thank you, Bill. Uh, as an example of this kind of inside-out, outside-in design, uh, I took it upon myself to provide this kind of a, uh, a design guideline to the, to the electrical engineers at Apple. Uh, this is a, a Macintosh a motherboard outline drawing that shows where it was attached to the chassis. Uh, probably not a, a traditional industrial designer would not get into uh, things at this depth. Uh, we were also taught in the Stanford Design Program to match the manufacturing processes with uh, marketing's forecast of how many units were to be made. Uh, obviously, it made sense to uh, be labor intensive when the volume was low, to be tooling intensive when the volume was high. Uh, and, and this was also part of our, our Stanford education. And finally, uh, important to remember that uh, Bob McKim always taught us to consider the profundity factor. Uh, which can be loosely defined as, you know, is, is what you're doing really going to make any kind of a difference in the world? Uh, and I think that's a really a good distinction, and I hope that's still continuing at Stanford. A uh, couple, uh, couple of other heroes that I'd like to mention. Uh, when I was getting my master's degree, I worked part-time at Spectra Physics. The head of design at Spectra Physics was Carl Clement, who... Uh, taught me really the importance of tooling. Carl did some amazing things uh, at tooling while he was at Hewlett Packard before he came to Spectra Physics and uh, really challenged me to consider that also as part of my, my designing as well as the aesthetic side of, of the designs. Uh, my thanks again also to Jack Magri from Hewlett Packard Corporate Design Group. When I was at HP for four or five years, the corporate group was coming up with some very important standards that could be used across divisions at, at Hewlett Packard to guarantee uh, uh, product identity and uniformity for the whole corporation. And I, and I really thank him for passing that on to me. And finally, uh, the evening wouldn't be complete. My personal hero, Arbuckminster Fuller. Uh, my, the name of my design business, Manic Comprehensive Design, was ripped off uh, specifically from Fuller, who called himself a comprehensive anticipatory design scientist. Uh, that was too long for a business card, so I shortened it, mine to comprehensive. Uh, and 
I really learned from, from Buckminster Fuller studying what he had done that you should always consider alternative solutions to problems. So a little homage to those, those folks. Uh, I call myself a slab designer. This was uh, before the days of computer-aided design. The reason for my uh, definition of a slab designer is because everything that I did for Apple, including uh, Macintosh starting with Apple II, was, was planar. Everything was in the intersection of flat planes. The reason we did this was we, we had to come up with, uh, with drawings, dimension drawings to the thousandth of an inch of, so the tooling people could make the tool to make the parts. And uh, I couldn't dimension multi-curvilinear surfaces, so I'm a slab designer. Uh, for, for the Macintosh, for the rear housing here, once the drawings were done, uh, we turned it over to a very talented machinist who made a, an acrylic model uh, accurate to five thousandths of an inch. Took him over 30 days to do that. When I consider now with uh, some of the rapid prototyping tools, you can see results in a matter of hours rather than a matter of months. Uh, the whole purpose of this long process of dimension drawing, make a model, measure the model, see if it agreed with the, the um, the drawing was to validate the database, validate and to verify the database. And if, if and uh, when the, the part that came up from, away from the machinist matched the print, uh, we call that sort of the golden drawing, much akin to you know, the golden uh, burned uh, silicon chip when a, when a ROM is, or a PROM is finally uh, finished. So while I was at Apple, uh, I, I kind of self-defined the scope of my work there, my responsibility, and uh, this included maybe some non-traditional things that industrial designers wouldn't normally do, but that I thought product designers should be uh, aware of and take responsibility for. Uh, here's the uh, much-aligned Pantone 453 uh, color, the, the apple beige. I have these pants done to match that PMS 453. <laughs> Uh, this, we very quickly found out that the PMS color system was not good enough for uh, specifying uh, plastics. So we went to a Munsell system uh, and a very involved triaxial color coordinate system where you could, you could define a color, uh, spectral response of a color down to a, a thousandth of something. I don't remember what it was. Um, and then we had to get color cards made for Apple. We had to distribute them to the quality assurance people. We had to test the quality assurance people to make sure that they uh, were not colorblind, which turns out one was. And um, <laughs> so that was one, one uh, role I took on while at Apple. Another was to, again, like I learned at HP, to try to get some kind of uniformity across the ever-growing number of divisions at Apple. This was a quick drawing of uh, uh, some corporate identification uh, that would work for a model and also a, a division. Uh, the, the current Apple monocolor, Apple, not Apple computer, but Apple logo, we were playing around with this idea, you know, in 19, 1983. These were some uh, attempts at, at coming up with the five rainbow Apple colors with a slightly different different logo uh, for a nameplate. Then comes, then comes defining process, okay? Uh, we were at that time doing our, our, our product dimension specifications on drawings. Uh, we wanted the, the drawing paper to look as good as the product, so we spent a lot of time designing the paper that we would do the designs on. Uh, <laughs> Apple starting out, you know, five people in, in Steve Jobs' father's garage, uh, there weren't any processes, so we had to somehow keep track of drawings. From my HP experience, uh, I helped put together a series of drawing specification uh, charts, engineering change order charts, everything that it would take to, uh, to actually have a real company. Um, also the traditional mechanical engineering uh, functions of calculating stresses, uh, making material selections based on the environment they were going to be used, uh, thermal management. Remember, Steve 
Jobs had dictated no fans will ever be in an Apple product. And uh, we had to ad adhere to that by doing very complicated thermal management, uh, one of which I can share with you uh, really surprised visitors when they came around through the engineering labs. We had a back room with no windows, and we bought a bunch of incense sticks. And we'd take a product in there and light the incense stick and stick it in by where the product circuit board was and watch how the, how the heat coming off the board would flow through the product. Well, you can imagine two or three hours of doing this in a closed room. <laughs> when they'd open the door, it was, you know, what are they doing in there? Uh, <laughs> but it was a really cheap way to see how the airflow was going. So. And an another thing I'm really proud of at Apple is the iconic labeling that came out on the Macintosh. Uh, my design team and I went to the Hanover Fair in about 1983, 82 or 83, to looking for how do, how do international companies identify the different connective ports on the, on the backs of their products. And we found out a really surprising thing. The predominant, uh, predominant use of uh, a way to identify ports was absolutely nothing. No words, no symbols, no nothing. You would sort of, I guess, look in the instruction book and count third from the left and see where you plugged something in. Uh, the second most predominant was English words. And we thought, that's rather strange. We, we were, uh, knew we were an international company, and we thought, by God, we're going to do iconic representation where people don't have to know a language to find out where to plug things in. And we actually contributed some of these symbols to the international community uh, at no charge to, to try to get the usage out there. Um, and finally, uh, I wanted to talk about how do you get free flow of design ideas or any other ideas for that matter going across comp a company where the divisions are growing rapidly. And uh, we came up with the idea of uh, in, in London in you know, the early years, they had uh, guilds. The, the uh, locksmiths had a guild, the carpenters had a guild. We came up with a product design guild. And, and all designers from all divisions met uh, once, or, once or twice a month to talk about how uh, the product, what products were coming out of those divisions and how they could look, look uniform across the whole uh, company. So I, I think that's one of the contributions that a lot of people don't, don't know about. Um, so we've gone to the first part of the talk. The second part is, in hindsight, what would I have done differently? And uh, I said I was going to talk about the Apple III. And Bill, you can get on the video camera there. And we can switch off of my computer. This is a, uh, a casting for the Apple III. Um, those of you who were at Apple remember that, that when the Apple III was being thought about, Wendell Sanders' uh, Sarah project, codenamed Sarah, uh, the FCC was just realizing that, hey, these things put out EMI and RFI, and we better do something about that. Uh, we knew that regulations were coming out. We didn't know what the regulations would be. Uh, so basically, the Apple III is a, was meant to be a bomb-proof enclosure, uh, <laughs> bomb-proof from the, the standpoint of signals coming out of the machine. And it turns out with castings like this, aluminum castings bomb-proof the other way, too, inside out, outside in. Um, okay, Apple III. My big regret is that um, we, Dean Hovey and I from Hovey Kelly Design were co-designers on this, this product, and we determined that uh, the power supply, in talking to the analog engineers, power supply had mean time between failure was a lot lower than the motherboard. So we thought, unlike uh, the Apple II, uh, we'll, we'll sink the power supply up inside the, the body of the machine, and that'll give us the whole bottom footprint of the Apple III for, uh, for the motherboard. And we thought that was a pretty neat idea, and we could justify it uh, with some, some degree of techno babble. Um, and we went into a review meeting where uh, Dean and I and, and Tom Whitney, who was the engineering manager, and Steve Jobs were, and we presented the idea to them. And uh, much like the dictum of our computers will never have any fans, the dictum was uh, told to us that all Apple power supplies will be separately removable, which uh, we accepted. And therefore, what happens to the motherboard? It shrinks by 33%. Uh, 
as you all recall, the, uh, the introduction party at Disneyland, uh, Steve uh, invited uh, you know, 40,000 of his best friends to come down to Disneyland when the product was introduced uh, for an evening. We took over the park, and uh, that set in motion the introduction, which uh, all of a sudden reports were coming in that the product is intermittent, has intermittent failures. What's happening with the intermittent failures? Uh, everybody pointed their finger at me, thermal, thermal, thermal. It's completely enclosed. Well, we'd, we'd figured out that there's enough surface area inside this to dissipate most of the heat, if not all the heat, that would ever be generated from this machine. Uh, but I did hours and hours and hours of testing with my, uh, well, my incense stick to try to uh, prove to them that it wasn't a thermal problem. Uh, Bill, if you can... Five Ooh, okay. Later I'll show you, if you come up to the table, uh, a little piece of uh, copper that we had tried to, to try to get some more heat out of the, uh, the tops of the, the integrated circuits to the chassis. Turns out the, the, the problem was basically uh, this was the last circuit board that Apple laid out, hand taped, you know, red tape, photo reduced. Colette Asklin did a wonderful job of taping it, but the lines had very slight waver to them. And where the lines got close together, there were microscopic hairs of solder jumping over that would, that would go away when you really got in there and looked at it, and that caused the intermittent problem. Once that was solved, the Apple III was the most, you know, most uh, rock-solid computer that Apple had designed up to that time. Uh, Andy, if that's not true, don't say anything. <laughs> uh, the moral of the story, uh, Davy Crockett said, be sure you're right, then go ahead. If I'd have insisted on that and been a little more diligent in improving my our design concept, the Apple III might not have failed, and Apple might have uh, $500 billion in the bank by now rather than... 200, I think it is. So, uh, I just want to pay a little tribute uh, in my time left. Uh, some values, personal relationships within our design group. Uh, I could not have possibly uh, come up with a successful Macintosh without uh, Terry Oyama, the senior designer uh, in our group. Terry and I worked together a lot on. Uh, on collaborative design. Dave Roots, the senior draftsperson, Ben Pang, uh, draftsperson, and Steve Balog, a tooling engineer, uh, sort of the un un untold hero of the Mac group. Steve helped us get tooling uh, done, which uh, had like this little chassis down here for the Macintosh uh, that you can see later on, uh, had never been done before. And it goes along with uh, personal relationships within the design group. We had very close personal relationships uh, with our vendors. Bob France from Camfran Tool Company in Chicago, who came up with that most innovative chassis, one-piece stamping. Uh, Ken Arts, Kosigi Leather and Vinyl, uh, who made carrying cases for us whenever we asked for them, overnight, with no charge at all, uh, because he was excited about the project and excited about our vision. Phil Jaxey, PTA in Boulder, Colorado, did the soft tooling. Bill Jacks, he spent many unpaid hours helping us with this, this. Harold Hoffman, Northern Engraving, nameplates. I could talk for half an hour about Apple nameplates, how they're great graphically, but how it was impossible to carry them through to three dimensions. And this gentleman from Northern Engraving solved those problems for us. Uh, I'm running out of time, so let me just um, talk one more second about the value of concurrent development. Andy will remember, maybe, I hope, uh, the door to the, the software programming area was always open, as was the door to the uh, industrial design product design group in the Mac division. Uh, one day I was wandering through there and looked over Andy's shoulder and saw that he had the, the desktop up on the computer and it had a square corner. The light colored CRT had a square corner. And I said, Andy, our bezel has a rounded corner wouldn't it be nice if the desktop had a similar rounded corner to blend with that? He says, oh, yeah, no problem. Two seconds, it was done. Uh, little details like that make, make our product, make the Macintosh a, a success, I think. Uh, incredible uh, attention to detail. Likewise, we took all of our drawings, like I showed you at, at first, uh, and we posted them in poster racks on the wall at our, uh, where our group sat. 
with a dangling pencil, red pencil on the end of a, a string, and ask anybody from, you know, vice president, president, CEO, down to the janitor if they thought something should be changed to please write the change on the drawing and give us your name and phone number so we can call you. So the idea that we were designing together, intermeshing concurrently, I think is really key to the success of, of the products up to uh, Macintosh, and I'm really uh, interested in, in hearing how that was carried on through Bob's tenure there. So that's about all I have. Uh, please come up afterwards and I can tell you some more about these little artifacts here. Andy, I, I did bring a, uh, a sweatshirt there that says, uh, working 90 hours a week and loving it. Thank you. Do you need this? Yeah. Okay. I think it was screwed in. Yeah. Okay, I guess we can switch back to slides. this in here. As I like to say, ignore the man behind the curtain. I should have turn, saved turn my number four mic off, please. <laughs> okay, so while it's, so there we go. Are we up? Yes, maybe, maybe not. That looks like something. There we go. Okay. So, um, Thank you very much. It's very, very nice to be here. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting for me. Uh, well, first of all, I want to make a comment. Bill had talked about the, the, the company I've started, and uh, I made it sound like I'm not going to be consulting anymore. That's just a ploy because I'm still a competitor of his. So this is typical uh, Bill Mogridge subterfuge. Um, <laughs> so this, is, this was really interesting for me coming here um, on, on a couple fronts. So first of all, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a child of the, uh, the computer industry. My, my father... Uh, develops the, the first Winchester disk drives at IBM and uh, went on to form a company called ISS. I grew up with 14-inch disk drives in my garage next to my bicycle. And, and literally uh, three or four of the products that he worked on are, are in, in the museum here, so it's really great to see that. The second thing is they took us on a back room tour, and back here is an archive um, with... Um, I, I feel like I'm being stalked because virtually every product in the computer business that I've done from the time I got out of school up until maybe um, you know, eight years ago is in there. You know? And so walking down the aisle and seeing all these objects there stacked up, covered with dust, little tags on them, it's kind of interesting. Um, the other data point that was interesting for me is getting this stuff out of the storeroom, which I hadn't done for years, and our 20-something our, um, our receptionist um, looked at them like they were, like it was a 1957 Chevy. You know, and you know, I said these are only 12 years old. I mean, that's like a, you know a 95 Jetta, you know. Um, but to her, no, this was like, my God, look at those things. So it, it shows the the speed at which this industry progresses, and how quickly things age, and how quickly things change, and and invalidate what you what you've done just a few years ago. So the last thing is, um, I didn't, uh, apparently the email about the, what we're supposed to talk about that Jerry got, I got filtered. So I'm, <laughs> I have, I really have, I had a fun time yesterday going down through all my, my uh, photo archives. So I'm taking a little, a little walk with a lot of pictures down memory lane. Uh, most of which are by a gentleman out here, Rick English, who is, uh, was sort of my um, chronicler of, of the work during this period. So. Um, so this, this, my story starts with working at, uh, at Lunar Design. We started this company pretty much out of school. This is one of the few analog things that I ever did. It was a periscope. And um, began to work with Apple Computer. And interestingly enough, it was very much sort of undercover. At that time, the, the relationship with Frog Design was very strong. It was a very, very airtight contract. We weren't supposed to be working with other design firms. so. Um, I was really hired to do what were described as engineering functions um, and really studies with the advanced technology group and a couple CPU groups and, and Bill Dresselhaus, if any of you, how many people know Bill Dresselhaus here? There's a few hands going up with Bill. And this was one study we had done which was on um, a 3D input device. So in, in, but what I, what I began to understand is these were tests. These were little tests that they were giving me and my team at Lunar to figure out whether we could be a possible resource. And so then, then I was given a couple real things. Uh, 
This was uh, an Apple II uh, follow-on um, called the Apple II SI. It didn't ship. It went, went to tooling, but began to get more immersed into the culture. And then, and then had, had what would be described as a, as a big break, which was um, became involved in the development of the Macintosh LC, which at that time was the highest volume computer ever, ever made, probably prior to the iMac. Um, and that, that was a substantial uh, undertaking for us, and, and it went to market and, and did extremely well. Interestingly enough, it, it actually started out looking very different from this. We had um, some very radical designs. One we called Webster, which was, looked like a dictionary, sort of the format. Uh, one we called a boombox, which looked like a boombox. And then this fairly um, straightforward slab version. And, and the person who made the decision was, was John Scully's assistant, Amy Bonetti. Um, in typical Apple fashion, we had an executive review, and everybody's arguing about it, and they uh, said, well, let's get, let's get uh, a woman's opinion. We're all a bunch of men, and Amy came in, and she said, I like that one, and the decision was made. And, that's, <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, you know, for all the science, that's how Apple operated, which was one of the great things about, about working at the company. So about this time, another, another fun one I had was the precursor to General Magic was working with um, a guy named Mark Perot in the Advanced Technology Group, and we did a bunch of studies on what this handheld device could be. And um, these were all hard models, which apparently all were, was ever made were hard models. But it, um, and so that, about that time then, um, I got approached by my main, um, the guy I worked with the most, Richard Jordan, to come in and, and be the director of design. And, and at the time, I thought, well, I'm young enough to make a big mistake, and so let's, you know, and it would be a great experience. So I decided to do it, which was a good thing. But I had, first I had to get by this guy, um, Jean-Louis Gasset. And uh, I had, uh, I think, 14 to 16 interviews at Apple. Only one mattered, and that was Jean-Louis. And uh, I remember him looking through my book, and you would uh, um, alternate between, oh, this is nice, and this sucks, and this is nice, and this sucks. And that, I began to understand this was Jean-Louis and his way of, of, sort of establishing himself as a personality. Um, so anyway, I, I managed to make it, make it past Jean-Louis. It was hired, and with, with the in, entire intention of, of managing Jean-Louis, for whatever reason, it was, people thought I could manage Jean-Louis from a design point of view, because he was the bottleneck. About six months into it, Jean-Louis left. So um, then the, the next uh, leader that I worked with, as Bill mentioned, I was between jobs, so literally, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> which, uh, which is probably a good thing. I, I'm, from what everything I know about Steve, I, I would have been fired during that period at some point. So um, or, John Scully, for the most of my tenure, took the highest uh, high, sort of a role in design. John. Um, was uh, um, really wanted to be involved in technology, wanted to be involved in design. He um, referred to himself as the, the chief technologist and, and was very active with us working, and especially on the things on the more conceptual side. Um, the last few years was Michael Spindler, who um, was, was a very operationally focused individual, but, but at the same time very emotional and passionate about design. All of, all of these guys had an imprint on, on what we did. But one of the first major projects I jumped into was the, the PowerBook, which wasn't originally called the PowerBook. That was at the end. But, but here was the problem I was addressed. I was pointed. We, about the time I joined, we introduced the Mac Portable, which um, I remember I had one. And when I, when I traveled with the Mac Portable, I had to get a first class seat. And I had to make sure I was an aisle seat on the left-hand side of the plane so I wouldn't elbow anybody as I tried to use the trackpad because the thing was about 18 inches wide. Um, wait, oops, there's a typo. That should say 16-pound Mac portable, um, which is literally what it weighed. And about the same time, Compaq came out with the LTE, which is about half the weight. Uh, and so the, there was a huge amount of pressure on the designers. They said, look, we have to do something about this. We have to catch up. In retrospect, that was one of the best things for a designer because the, the um, aversion to risk went way down. Everyone was like, well, we got to do something. So, so um, we came up with this really interesting design, which actually I, I would love to take full credit for it, but it were, there was a guy in the um, hardware development group named John Krakauer who was the proverbial um, loose cannon. I mean, uh, John fancied him, he's a really great individual, fancied himself a Renaissance man. Uh, was an electrical engineer, and he invited us to his cubicle one day, and he had hacked up this uh, Mac PowerBook and moved things around, 
into this. This was one of the first ID models we built, but um, this is the basic idea. Is he said, well, what if we moved the battery and the hard drive in the front and pushed the keyboard in the back and put that pointing device in the middle? Because going back to the Mac Portable, the problem that Compaq didn't have is they, at that point, they weren't, they didn't really, were pushing a graphical uh, UI and they would have, you know, stick on trackballs, but they really didn't have this issue of the pointing device. So John came up with this idea and we saw it and we immediately latched onto it because what we realized is that it gives you a constant work surface no matter where you are on your lap, on the plane, whatever, your, your work surface is always consistent, your pointing device is where you need it. And, you know, one of, one of my points of pride in my career is that you, virtually every, every notebook on the market today utilizes this configuration. So I just wish I would have patented it under my name instead of that. <laughs> so then the uh, PowerBook 100 and 140 came out, which were both incredibly crash programs to get to market, full of pain, full of misery. Um, the 100 was actually built by Sony. We, uh, we developed in collaboration with Sony, and, and the, the 140 was done internally. Uh, we, the thing that was interesting about the PowerBook is the realization that we made in looking at these things is they're personal objects. Um, and we used to have this mantra about it's not a shrunken desktop, where we felt like most of the industry was looking at their notebooks as we'll take a desktop vernacular and shrink it down. And we said, no, these are things like your briefcase, your wallet, your whatever, your folio that you take with you. They should be detailed that way. They should be colored that way. They should feel that way. These are the things. And that, that really was sort of key to the PowerBook proposition. Um, I, I only have so much time. I can tell a really long story about the color, which you know today looks unbelievably bland. But at the time, it was really radical to go dark. And it, it had one of the, the most um, amazing battles I've had in my career about making that product dark. Um, the PowerBook Duo family, which was, I, I think, one of the best pieces of design we've ever done. It was ahead of the time because you know, it had no removable media in the device. It didn't have a, a floppy drive. And the majority of the world weren't used to that idea. Those of us that understood networking and how to work thought this was an amazing product. It was small, light, tight, easy to carry. It was, it was a fantastic product. And we developed a docking system that would allow you to connect into network, connect into peripherals. And then this product, which um, has some significance beyond its innovation, it was, um, this was developed at, uh, with IDEO, and it was a motorized dock that took the computer in and became a desktop. But I want to talk a little bit about what a lot of my job at Apple was, was charting the visual direction of the products and what do we do. And this idea of design language, that, that's a real common term in the design business of the vocabulary you use to shape your products and define your corporate identity and the experience people have with them. And we, we were starting to develop some new ideas, but this was this weird product that was in between. So we had like the lower half was part of a new idea and the upper half was part of an old idea. And it was actually, uh, from a design point of view, an abysmal failure. Um, we had no, completely slammed around it from, from a visual point of view. And it gave us realize, okay, none of this transition stuff, we have to, we have to move forward aggressively. So when you start looking at design language, um, you have to look at the legacy. And, and this is, um, I, I refer to this, the, the, the products that happened um, prior to the time the frog design became involved as um, Silicon Valley Provincial. And, <laughs> and that's, that's not a slam. That, that's just kind of a cute way of saying it was very much about this place. It was very much about what people um, in this area saw and felt about computers and what they should look like and how, they, uh, and how they should be put together. And that was fantastic for the time. But um, when, when Steve Jobs hired Frog, they came with a, with a broader, I wouldn't say even beyond international perspective, where they saw the computer as an object in our lives that will be in our lives and, and, and very, a much more broader look at it. And, at that time in the industry, when, when Bill came over with ID2, it, for us locals, it really was a wake-up call to see this, here's a, here's a different approach to design that is much broader and, and much more about people and, and, and lifestyle as opposed to what we know and how computers are go, to, go together and, cons and are constructed. Um, the frog design, the Snow White language, as it was coined, um, had, a, had a very long run. It was a very fantastic um, um, approach to design. This is about it as prime. There's some really great products that came out. I think the Laser Writer 2 was an amazing piece of visual sculpture. Um, the original Image Writer, uh, or the Image Writer 2, some really fantastic products. But that, it started to, about this product, 
the, the Macintosh 2SI and 2CX in this box, it started to decline. And um, one little anecdote back to the Mac Portable, one of the problems with the Mac Portable is it was designed exactly like the 2CX, um, like a desktop. And, and this, this, this product um, was functionally a fantastic product from a manufacturability, assembly, serviceability, great. But it, it somehow began to lose the soul. Um, the other problem that we realized with this approach was it, it, it was extensible. We looked down and saw not only power books, we saw um, handhelds, we saw CD-ROM players, all kinds of personal products that, you know, you're, you're going to apply this approach that looks just like a desktop to it. It didn't make sense. So we began to define something new. Um, another person here in the audience, Bill Burnett, at that time, I was still, I was just kind of going back in time, I was hired at Lunar to come and look at this program called Jaguar, which was being led by a fellow named Hugh Martin, those of you may know Hugh, not sure where he is today, but it was going to change the Mac, it was a new hardware architecture, a new software operating system, uh, risk-based, it was very aggressive, and we were involved in developing design proposals. This was one actually done by um, Giorgetto Gujaro in Italy was hired at the time to do proposals, and we were doing some as well. Um, this was uh, one of mine. I did a couple versions, a, a, a white one and a black one. I decided to be extreme, and the white was very soft and, and very much about a, a, a very personal expression. The, the black was, was very aggressive and, and linear and strong. What, what happened was we sort of pulled all this work together. Also, IDEO, um, Mike Nuttall was doing some work on the project as well and done, had done a really great display. We pulled that all together into this, um, this design proposal, uh, which really was the roots of, of this language we came to know, be known as espresso, named after the coffee maker that was always running in the studio. And this, this really was the foundation of the next generation of, of where we were gonna go from a design point of view. It was, uh, it, some of these, the products from that study came to production, the audio vision display, which I have one here, which had uh, amazing sound, had built-in subwoofer, stereo sound. Um, it, was, it was a fantastic product. The adjustable keyboard, which uh, had, you know, allowed people to start at a traditional angle and move outward to reduce uh, potential tension in, in the wrist. Uh, we were able to bring that to production despite um, the Apple legal team not wanting us to. <laughs> It's an interesting uh, uh, conundrum that they wanted uh, the fact that if, if you came out with a product that addressed a um, human factors problem was an admission that there was a problem. So, <laughs> you know, play with that one for a while and see if they ever do anything innovative. But we did manage to get, <laughs> get the product out and uh, it, it was very successful. Um, the CPU kind of grew and changed and became a very productive enclosure for the company was the Quadra and then the transition to PowerPC. Um, one anecdote in there, there was a lot of argument we moved from the, um, to risk whether we should stay the course in design versus doing something different. We were the proponents of doing something different from a color and design point of view. Um, John Scully wanted to do something different. Michael Spindler wanted to stay the course, didn't want to upset the user base. There was a meeting set up to where I was to present some new ideas, even though Michael Spindler told me not to. John wanted them. John was supposed to show up. I'm there getting ready to present. I look out the table. John Scully's not there. And I look at John's uh, um, assistant, Carl Gustin, said, where's John? He said, no. I, I got ripped the, to the, the highest level I ever had in my career by Michael Spindler about what the hell are you doing? I told you not to do this. Da, 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 da. It was, it was actually the worst situation I've ever been in my career. And I thought, I went home, I thought, all right, there goes my job. But um, apparently we, they made up and uh, we managed to move on. Um, I'm going to go through these quickly and finish up. Um, I have to say something about Jonathan Ive. I, um, Jonathan, actually, I talked to him about coming to this tonight, and he's, he's uh, traveling in Asia, so he couldn't. Um, but I think when, when I die... What's going to be on my two st tombstone, it's going to say the guy who hired Jonathan Ive. <laughs> because, I, I, you know, I've been out of Apple for over 10 years. Every, virtually every interview I do, still people want to talk about uh, Apple. And then I usually get, well, what was Jonathan like, you know? <laughs> so, but, but Jonathan um, is a friend, and he was an amazing designer. I originally interviewed him at Lunar. Um, he was uh, right out of school, tried to get him to come over. He didn't want to. Um, 
When I first came to Apple, I tried to hire him again. He didn't want to. Um, then we hired him. He had started a, a company called Tangerine. We hired him for a project. And uh, it, was, it was, again, a little bit of a, a lure, much like I've been lured in the company. Um, so he did the project, came over, saw the sunshine, saw the work, did a little calculation on the paycheck, um, and decided to, uh, decided to join our team in 1992. And, and uh, when I left, it recommended him to, to run the group, which is probably one of the better recommendations I've ever made. So this idea of espresso just began to grow, and the, the Color Classic was, was a really, um, really interesting, controversial project for us, very expressive, moving, moving away from the, the original uh, Macintosh uh, format more aggressively, and, and it was one of those real love-hate products. People either loved it or hated it. Um, the, the personal laser rider, I think, was one of the pure expressions of the design approach involving, you know, precision, curvature, symmetry, this idea of an, more of expressiveness in, in the form. Um, Style Rider 2 was another, another fantastic product. Um, PowerBook 500. This was kind of where we started actually maybe going too far with it. I think we began to just, every, every surface we could find, we, we, we trade, put a developed form onto it, and it, I think it began to be too much, as evidenced by the Quick Take 100, which I think, I, I have one here. It just, it's just amazing when I look at the, the resolution of the pictures that this thing took, and it was just fantastic to look back at it. Um, and the, the original ADB mouse, which actually lived for quite a long time. And then the, uh, the, this is one of Jonathan's pieces where I think he really helped us sort of pull this language into a much tighter, much more precise format. Um, switching gears. I'm trying to meet my 20 minutes without blowing it too much, which I think I already have. Um, Newton. I saw Larry Tesler out there. Larry, there we go. Larry will correct me on other things I say that are wrong. But Newton, there was the original um, Newton product was to be designed, again, by, by Gujaro. He was hired by Gasset, uh, or Gasset wanted him. There was a bit of a design off with uh, Tori Satsas, Smart Design, Gujaro. And uh, there was this, this project going on, which was being kept out of the industrial design group. And I remember coming and going, well, that's the really cool thing. How come we're not working on it? So uh, we kept trying to get involved, kept trying to get involved, and know that we're, we're committed to this design. In fact, I'd even um, done you know, concepts on the side of doing our own models and saying, look, 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 at these are really cool. What do you think of that? Uh, but no, it was very, very much entrenched. Well, the, the, that product never ended up going to market. It actually went to tooling. It was a, um, a fairly laborious pro process to get there due to the complex geometry. Uh, but what happened then, in typical fashion, is they've been going on for years, and then it's like, okay, no, we're going to do this new product. It's, it's uh, I believe it was Sharp, right? It's based on a, a Sharp platform. We had like, you know, two weeks to design it. And you know, after years of development, okay, you guys, we're going to do this. We have two weeks to design it. So um, we, we cranked out the message pad 100. The great story there was we, um, we showed it to John Scully, and he said, well, it's got to fit in a coat pocket. And, you know, he's, no one wears a jacket like this at Apple. And so we're in his office, and he says, well, here, let me see. He has a jacket in his closet. He gets it out, puts it on. It won't fit. All right, we go back, we shave some millimeters off, we, the pen was round, now it's flat, we get it down. We, I have everybody bring in every coat they have. We do <laughs> the coat test, it's great, it fits. We go back to his office, gets on his coat, it won't fit. And I realized it was like he had like the 10th percentile coat pocket <laughs> in his jacket that was probably costing the company, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars to keep going on and on and developing this thing. but. We were going to sneak in late at night and take out a few threads, so it would fit. <laughs> but uh, we eventually did. Then the message pad 110, 130, which Jonathan did, did a, a fantastic job on, spent, spent uh, a good time, good part of his life with Inventech in Taiwan. The, the message pad 2000, which I actually used for quite a while, I think. Unfortunately, the legacy of Newton, by the time it got here, it actually worked really well. I mean, the, the recognition was pretty good. It, it had connectivity, it actually was a very viable platform to, to use to communicate and work. And I, I used mine extensively while traveling. But, you know, we all know the story of Newton. It unfortunately didn't continue on. There was another product after that, which was another large format, sort of harking back to the original um, format that we had done internally.
Um, concepts, I could spend an hour talking just about concepts that we had done. We did some silly things as promotions. This was the time ban and the, uh, the money exchanger that you'd put your money in and it would grind it up and print out some new money for you. <laughs> um, we did a whole slew of silly concepts for Newton and then there was a GPS that used um, visual landmarks as opposed to maps to tell you, tell you how to find things. Um, a mobility study after the power book to try and find different, uh, different modes of uh, modularity and, and, and flexibility. Um, there was a, a program called Popeye, which was a, uh, a mobile CD-ROM player that had a uh, interactive UI. It was largely for industrial applications. Um, we actually did a Macintosh tablet, um, which, which didn't get too far, but it was actually a really, really beautiful design. And then finally, was my, my, my swan song was this product down at the end here, uh, which ironically pr led to my decision to move on, was this um, product originally called P Pomona, and we'd, we had done a study to, we really felt the company needed a new icon. The, the PowerBook that was, had been out for a while, the original Mac had sort of lost some of its luster, and there was nothing that, you know, Apple as a company, if anything, continues to understand the power of iconic design. And whether it's iMac, iPod, iPhone, you see the company will regularly refresh the icon of what it stands for. And we felt, well, we're, we don't have this. There's nothing in development that's going to meet this. Let's come up with it on our own. So we did this study around the idea of a, of a flat panel-based PC, which this was, let's say, 1994, you know, which really wasn't happening. But we were seeing, with notebooks, volume going up, prices dropping, and the possibility of it happening. So we started the study. We did all kinds of things, developed some crazy concepts, um, um, some things that were just really beautiful. This is uh, Tim Parsi did this this uh, product we called Scoop, and then um, and then this one which was going back, this this down in the uh, the lower right this foam that I had done of this sort of what we began to call the Bang and Olsen Macintosh, and um, it was just laying everything out in a linear fashion, just a beautiful slight sweep high quality audio, subwoofer, and really it was all about design. And what became really frustrating for me was I felt at the time the company didn't get it. For a design driven company, since there was no, other than the audio, no new technology in this, I couldn't gain support. I actually acted as marketing manager for a while trying to get it to go and so forth. Well, it eventually did. It, it, um, it did ship as uh, the 20th anniversary Macintosh. Um, and, uh, there was, I won't mention his name, but a certain individual marketing had the bright idea to make it a $10,000 product. Came out, and then when that didn't sell, well, we'll, we'll make it a $7,000 product. Uh, no, maybe maybe a $5,000 product. And and unfortunately, it, it it died. We'd originally seen it as um, you know around a $3,500 product, which had reasonable volume. But that that sort of what was going on in the company at that time was so many different people coming into the culture and struggling about what design was, it led me to believe it was probably time to move on. I went to Panagram. Um, the final, the last thing that was going on in the studio when I left, which was really um, Jonathan and the team sort of really taking ownership and moving on, was, was this idea of translucency um, that was originally began to pioneer in the Newton School, which we call the school book. But that, that became the new direction, and it was just beginning to happen about the time I came back from my sabbatical and said, I'm out of here. So that's, a, that's the little walk down memory lane. So I wanted to thank you very much. I dug this. I went through all my Apple slides, and I found this, which was, again, sort of heartwarming to see that. So um, anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you both very much. Um, yeah, I'd like to open it to the floor just in a few minutes, but I have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask these guys in advance. Perhaps we could bring the lights up when it's convenient. Um, Jerry, um, you know, you were disarmingly modest, I thought, to talk about your design by slab sides and uh, really giving the impression that the only thing you really did was choose the color of your pants a few years <laughs> in advance. Um, but uh, tell us more about the aesthetic choices that you made with the Macintosh, because you know, it has this sort of bevel detail all around side and the sort of details of the, uh, of the uh, uh, vents and so on. 
but it is the most iconic computer that's ever been done. I mean, there's something about the quality of that visual impact which was so unique and so new at the time. Um, could you talk about the aesthetic, both of the detailing, but also the impact? Mm. Uh, is this on? Yeah, good. Um, we, we realized from some talking to people, office workers, that technology was a was, uh, potential threat to them. Uh, sharp edges say, don't touch me. So we thought the, the overall physical shape, the form, should somehow be softened. So that's really the reason for, the, for some of the uh, chamfers and bevels. Uh, we also said this is going to be sitting on the CEO's desk. Uh, someone that comes in to see the CEO is going to see the back of it. That should be equal, equally as uh, attractive as the front. Uh, that was another design aesthetic decision. Uh, the, the chassis inside, I have to give credit. I don't think it's ever been given before. Uh, when my wife and I were first married, we had a little $90 Sony TV set. I think it was an 8-inch diagonal. Uh, sold for $90. And uh, I thought, what, what better way to, to get a jump on designing the inside of this thing than to tear that TV set apart and see how they made it. Turned out that they made it out of uh, cold rolled steel, pre-plated, uh, but it was three pieces. And we said, well, we'll copy that exactly because this is a super high volume product, uh, but we'll make it in one piece. And that's where the outside vendor came in that took that on as a challenge and ran with, with that idea. Uh, so basically, uh, softness, eliminate a potentially threatening new piece of equipment. And uh, that's, that's where the aesthetic came from. Thank you. So Bob, um, you showed us a lot of really sort of interesting experimental seeming concepts. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, you know, you talked a lot about the development of the visual language starting from the Macintosh itself and moving through these different things with these engaging names like Snow White and mm -hmm. Espresso and so on. But tell us, you know, how, how did these concept designs inform the designs that were actually done? And, do you think they had value when you look back at them in hindsight? Yeah, yeah absolutely. What, what was going on is, um, you know, Jerry had mentioned about the, the time to market that he had experienced. It was, was compress, compressing at an unbelievably, unbelievable rate where, you know, where we, at, at one point we may have had six months to design something that was being compressed to three months and less. And what happens as a designer when you're, when you're under pressure to get something done, you tend to fall back on what you did before. You know, because you know it'll work, and you don't have time to validate it. And so, to combat that, we would we would do these conceptual exercises. Some of them were with basis working with the advanced technology group, and they were exploring a technology or a device. Some of them were on our own, just an idea that we had. But what it allowed us to do to, was to experiment and play around, play around with functionality, play around with form, play around with ideas, and then be able to integrate that into this, this sort of mainstream real-time work. And, and it was an incredibly valuable, and it was a way to fight that, okay, you got six weeks to design this, you know, you're going to be able to build it once, better be right. You know, so it allowed us to, to iterate and, and play with a little more freedom. And can I ask you both um, to a little bit about the way design has changed, and, or is changing, or perhaps has changed and will change? I mean, um, as you see the development over the times from the 80s on to now, and looking more perhaps into the future, I mean, can you comment on uh, what you see as having been the most dramatic changes, but also where you see the design moving at the moment um, as, as we move into the future? Uh, I, I think nobody needs to be reminded that miniaturization is, uh, you know, is rampant. Uh, things keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. The Saturday Night Live sketch that they did about the, the uh, not the nano, but the, you know, what is it called? Pico? Where you know, the, the, the comedian held up something that you couldn't see and said, this holds one million songs. Uh, you know, uh, I heard an interesting talk by Nokia, uh, a Nokia executive saying they could make a, a portable phone the size of a, a stick of gum, but nobody could interface with it. So I, I think we have to keep in mind that human beings all have to use these devices and that miniaturization for miniaturization's sake probably isn't a great idea. It just makes people frustrated if they can't, people with big fingers like myself can't
go in and, and, and successfully do things. So. Cocky pants and big things. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I wanted to echo that. I think what, what, what's happened with miniaturization is you can make it small, but the things that are now limiting are, are these things and these things and these things. So it, it, it's more, it, it even puts more, it gives more opportunity for the designer to, to have an impact in, in how things are shaped. Or it used to be, my first start of my career, everything was about, uh, about technology and about manufacturing, where now it, it's very, very much about design. Um, and and that, that's, that's probably the biggest difference. I, I, I've seen, the, again, the tools and technology allow us to do things faster and better, faster and better. Um, we're able to iterate more quickly, test, play with things in, in a much shorter amount of time and do much better design. But what, what really has changed just in the last uh, four, four or five years is how design has escalated as a strategic focus for business today and and that and it continues to do so that more and more companies gain an understanding of how you use design to re which is what's what's been obvious to all of us that are trained in the profession is of course it's important because it's what people interact with it's how you build your brand it is the things that you interact with are shaped by design but it's it's taken um, business as a whole to really understand that as a tool to really define who they are to their customers and to the market and so um, you know, years ago where I was fighting to do something, now I'm being pushed and pushed and pushed by, by business to do more and figure out how, how to more integrate what we do into, in, into the world of, of, of development. Want, want to follow on? Uh, who in the audience is qualified for AARP, 55 or, or greater? Okay, lots of us. Uh, I think this is a, an emerging trend. Uh, those of us that grew up with these devices uh, and, and use them in the middles of our careers are now a lot less intimidated by technology. So I think, I think designing for uh, the seniors among us will be an emerging area to, to really watch. So, um, yeah, one other question is about the level of integration across the disciplines, particularly between the physical design and the software. When you mentioned, Andy, you know, managing to accommodate the shape of the screen as, as an aspect of uh, collaboration. Um, and if we think of concepts, of course, knowledge navigate is a pretty mm -hmm. influential kind of thing. But would you, either of you like to comment? I mean, we've got Larry Tesla here mm -hmm. today. So, you know, I mean, you have to be careful. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> he'll be up there and telling us all about it. But, but um, you know, could you comment on the relationship that you felt you had when you were at Apple to the people who are developing the software? Uh, I, think, I think the easiest way to look at that is we were all uh, going after a goal. We all were trying to make a product that was for us, not necessarily for uh, you know, a focus group. Uh, so we, whether it was uh, Friday afternoon and we needed more boxes to be packed with, with computers in the back room, didn't matter what your job title was, you, you went after that goal and, and went and did it. Uh, it, it, it was a, a mass corporate buying in on an individual basis to a, to a common goal. And, you know, everybody that's worked with Steve, uh, we called it his reality distortion field, uh, I think is a very apt name. Uh, we, we bought into his, his dream and, and accepted it as, as our own and therefore all moved in the same direction. Was that the same in your time? It was, it was different. There were, there were two sort of worlds when I was there. Um, there was, the, in the mainstream world, you, you have to understand what at the time I was at Apple in that period that the company had become a $12 billion company. And, and the operating system was a platform that, that moved actually very slowly. And then there was hardware that was being developed around that platform. So the interaction between software and hardware in the mainstream point of view was actually fairly minimal. Um, then there were programs like Newton and a few others where we were, it, you know, where there was more integration between hardware and software. But what happened, interestingly enough, is that the design community started to force that. I, um, Joy Mountford's here. I mean, we used to seek each other out. She was in ATG and I was an industrial design group to find those opportunities because we, we all believed that that's how the company would progress and, and move beyond where it was today. And, and, and that did happen. That, ha that is essentially what, what happened with the iPod and, and, and the devices that are following where that came together. So it was kind of interesting where we had this 
separation between the, the OS and the hardware, but then at the same time, these things were bubbling up where we're being driven more from a collaborative point of view. Okay, well, let's open it up uh, to people to make comments and questions. And uh, please, um, when you speak, um, wait till you have a microphone and please say who you are and your affiliation because we've got this being recorded for posterity and we want to make sure that the record can hear you. So there's somebody over here. Or do you want to come out and uh, come up to the microphone? No. Are we on that? <laughs> well, that, we won't get the record. She'll turn it on for you. Maybe she will. Maybe. Is it on now? Oh. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Thanks. Uh, great talk, by the way. Uh, Dan Salzberg, I work for Portugal Consulting. I, I'm curious, Jerry, you um, showed the slide about the um, color, the beige color. And so I can see that that was a very deliberate choice. I, I'm just curious as to how you decided that it would be beige and what the story behind that was. Uh, very easy answer. I, is mine on? No. Yeah. Yeah. Can hear me? Um, I work for Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard at that time were coming out with uh, computers that, that had earth tones, predominantly earth tones, to go with the predominant uh, interior design of offices. Uh, at that time, so I just basically thought, let me let me find a color PMS 453 that comes really close to a beige color that would be neutrally uh, fitting into a lot of, of offices and 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 home furnishings. Uh, then it got a little harder because uh, we went to a darker chocolate brown color. Then I had to come up with an intermediate color between those two, and PMS didn't uh, Pantone matching system didn't do it for me, so. We got very involved then with the Munsell system of coming up with a uh, uh, arithmetic mean between the chocolate brown and the, and the beige, uh, which turned out to be pretty darn good. Uh, one, one final thought on color, uh, the Fortune magazine article came out about when Apple was doing the, the, uh, the clear plastic colors in reds and blues and yellows. Uh, I got dinged for selecting the beige color and uh, I sent about two weeks after that Fortune article came out, I heard on uh, National Public Radio that an astronomer had made a horrendous error in determining the color of deep space and had recalculated the color and guess what the, the color, the true color of deep space is? Beige. <laughs> so I felt vindicated. I sent that article to Steve and, and, and uh, said that there's some sort of cosmic, uh, you know, cosmic symmetry about that beige color. Well, I have to admit, uh, Jerry, I'm a little disappointed myself because I thought you'd had those pants since 1984. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a... Hi, uh, my name's Rohit Kare. I work for this dumb guy named Rohit Kare, so can't say much about that. You told the story of Apple terms and kind of its legendary self-reflective ones about its own history and its own past and not a lot of references to other design trends going on in outside world and in particular in other PC makers. I was wondering if respectively you guys had one or two ideas that you thought were going on in contemporaneously in the rest of the industry in computer design that you found interesting and either rejected or found that may have gotten incorporated into it. Well, I can speak about when we were there. there, there yeah, yeah, of course, as a designer, you're, you're always looking around you and seeing what's going on and drawing influences. Uh, the interesting thing about Apple, though, is that how Inherently, the company always leads. It, I mean, we, we, I wouldn't say that everything we did was original, but we'd start to build it into something that was solid and focused. And, but you know, what's amazing is in a year later, you see the entire industry tailing right behind it, um, and it, it, it's actually an incredible feeling for a designer. But yeah, well, we would we'd be you know you're constantly looking at what's going on in fashion, what's going on in architecture. Interestingly enough, I've always found how um, influential automotive design is. Um, to the rest of the design world because the lead time on a, on a car is, is incredibly long, but when it comes out, it, it has such an impact and starts to spur thinking in different areas. So, so for us, it was cars, buildings, clothing, you know, wh whatever you see, what you think was going on that was relevant to, to what you were doing. Uh, for our group, rather than come up with a, 
huge, thick design manual that talked about, you know, like IBM and some larger companies do, that talk about how design should be done and what the values should be. We uh, came up with the concept of having a, a room at Apple that had sort of iconic designs in it, uh, pictures of a, a Mercedes 350SL, uh, a Dansk uh, flatware, the teak handle with the, the beautiful shape spoon, that, that we wanted our design to, uh, to get people to emotionally react to like you would emotionally react to some of these uh, products. Sony, some of Sony's products were in that mix. And our idea was to take a new designer and literally force them in that room and lock the door for one solid day and let them walk around and handle things and look at things. And, and the, the idea was that when they came out of that, they'd have some kind of feeling for, uh, of what we were trying to accomplish with our products. So yes, we were looking around, uh, not specifically, but the, mainly for emotional uh, feeling of what, what these forms did for people. When they emerged, their eyes were like saucers, and they were shaking like a leaf. <laughs> you ready? So, hi, guys. Um, the, in China and India today... You are? I'm Lori Hobson, actually, from Cheskin High. <laughs> um, and I know these guys. <laughs> Most of... Many of the people in the world that are about... that'll buy the next computers, their first exposure to computing is actually through a cell phone. How do you think that's going to change the way we design computers? And especially, how do you think that design in the United States is going to change to deal with the fact that most of the markets are perhaps um, other countries like China and India? I, I can just speak briefly. Uh, on the 29th of June, we're going to find out. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I've, I've heard that the, the interface is going to be, you know, a sea change and that uh, this is going to be the wave of the future. I guess uh, Microsoft has preempted the uh, June 29th iPhone debut with their own kind of work surface, coffee table kind of thing, but similar sort of uh, human digit based, human appendage based interface that does away with uh, knobs, slide switches and all that stuff. Uh, so I, I think that's one way to get around the, the miniaturization aspect that I talked about earlier, is to, is to just go with a, a radically new and different user interface. And I, I'm really looking forward to Apple's uh, debut to see how that works. I think that's a trend. I, I, th I think what's interesting for me about that question is that there is, that, that is clearly become um, the most dominant pervasive platform in the world today that you know when you when you look at deployment of product across the world and it's driven from a variety of uh, perspectives and so it is interesting to think about if that's people's uh, a, a lot of people in the world if that's their understanding of computing where does it go from there and, and I'm, I'm not sure I have an answer for that it's it, it, the time will tell it, I think that what you see a lot is the, the limitations in that platform. It does a few things very, very well. Um, it starts to break when you do some other things. What I, what I find really interesting about information technology and computing is how it keeps um, the scale and number of devices across the spectrum keeps growing, you know, from the smallest to the, to the most complicated. And the holy grail for years has been convergence, but it never really happens because it just, the the devices become more and more specialized for each segment. So it, it'll be interesting to see about the iPhone whether some of that convergence does occur, but to date it doesn't. If you look, how many people here have a cell phone, um, a trio, and a laptop and carry them all with them? You know, a, f a fair amount do that, and the other goes with it. So uh, they each have a specialized purpose. They each have a scale UI that's appropriate to its purpose. They each have a form factor that does a certain job really well. So those. It, I think that's a trend that's going to, going to continue, and you'll just see more and more proliferation of different types of things to do different functions. Can I, can I there just... was a second half to her question, though, which was about the, the issue of where the majority market is. I mean, she's saying that cell phones are going to be used in more quantities in China and India than they ever are in the States. So, you know, the States has been used to being the dominant market in terms of being the people who use the products as they are innovated, and we're seeing a sea change there that in the future it'll probably be the users in China and 
and India and more populous parts of the world. I mean, do you have any comments about that part? Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to throw out a really interesting statistic. Uh, north of where I live in Vermont, there's an a international company called Husky Manufacturing, and they, they make tooling for uh, product manufacturers, and they make hot runner systems that where they can mold, you know, 72 shots in one, in one closing of the die. One of their very large customers is in China uh, making cell phones. And unlike here, when you, when you buy a cell phone number in China, uh, you can buy any number of phones that use that number. So uh, folks in China, young people particularly, uh, use these cell phones as fashion statements. They have a cell phone for the morning. They have a cell phone for when they play tennis. They have a cell phone for the afternoon. They have a cell phone for going out to a, a rave in the evening. And, and they might have six or eight cell phones. This is a staggering number. This company had to move a factory across the street in China to, a, to one factory that makes cell phones. Do you know how many people are employed in that one factory? 140,000 people in one factory, one manufacturer across the street from Husky Manufacturing. I mean, that's a staggering amount of product. Talk about short turnaround times. You can imagine what, what that's like. So I think we are going to, as soon as the, uh, you know, the, the product marketing managers look at the volume of product that can be kicked out, I'm sure that will influence them to sort of change their way of thinking about allocation of numbers. And I, I think we're going to be following rather than leading there. Any comments, Ryan? No, I guess it's just, it's amazing to me when I look at the, the cell phone, especially when I watch my kids and how they integrate in different aspects of life and their life and, and the increasing diversity of content that flows through it that, that you wouldn't expect. So it's, it, for me, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. And I, I think what, what's going to be interesting for me is that, that what's happening in other parts of the world, and I think what's driving a lot of the usage is the fact that the infrastructure is there to support these devices. That's what got them there in the first place. And what will happen on top of that? Where is it going to grow? Where is it? Thank you for your patience. Pardon my laryngitis. Uh, good evening. My name is Frank Weiss. Uh, I was in charge of the Apple patent department uh, during Bob's tenure. And uh, Bob was very um, uh, modest in his uh, statement that he didn't get any patent coverage. Uh, the other day, just for the heck of it, when I saw his name on the, uh, on the speaker list, I went to uh, the Internet and uh, got a copy of 18 patents that I got right. for him when he was at Apple. So I thought I'd... Right. <laughs> right. but, but before you get excited, I had to sign away all my rights, so that's... Uh, <laughs> Thanks. Next slide, Brian. Do we have time for Tom, Tom Parker. I did a, a security review for Apple during the Scully days, and I was wondering how important secrecy and successful secrecy was at the time. When I interviewed the engineers, uh, they seemed to be working very hard to keep things secret, and uh, the board they claimed kept leaking all their secrets, <laughs> and they said it was a strange ship that leaked from the top. <laughs> yeah, and right. I wondered uh, what your comment might be. Well, I think that's that's a fair description. When I was, I, I, I secrecy was always incredibly important. It, it is for any technology company, but Apple really understands, has always understood how the world is watching what it's going to do next. Um, not only to try and um, take advantage of that in their own business, but also to, to produce products to either compete or, or sell with the, with, with the Apple family products. So it was very, very big. But it was frustrating that you would, uh, I remember I won't mention the executive being, um, I was, went to a, a, a presentation with AT&T um, where there was, there was actually a point where AT&T was talking about uh, purchasing Apple and um, there, up on the stage, holding a prototype that was we had just finished, was was this certain executive saying, you know, we're we're going to ship this in, you know, in in six months, and it was probably two years away from shipping. But there he is, you know, showing it to the, the this, this entire other company. So, I I think 
that um, I think that obviously has changed quite a bit. Um, and again, I wouldn't call it pervasive, but I think there was there was um, there was always a desire to continue to promote the company and promote what we were doing. So that sometimes left that things slipped out that shouldn't have. Uh, quick, quick anecdote. Uh, next. <laughs> Macintosh uh, was developed in a, a second floor of a building on Stevens Creek that we called Texaco Towers because it was near a Texaco gas station. It wasn't near the, the official Apple campus on Bandley Drive. And we were all, there was about 14 or 15 of us there all working very clandestinely with no identification on the door. And we're well into the Macintosh project where we had physical prototypes, breadboards running. Uh, about 1.15 one afternoon, the door opens up and Steve Jobs walks in with Joan Baez and her sister. <laughs> Said, I just had, was having lunch with my friend here and she wants to get a computer for her son Gabe and I'm telling, uh, telling her about our new project that she should wait and buy that one. And uh, was that true, Andy? You were there. We're, our mouths just dropped open for probably, you know, five minutes as he was showing her around and then walked out the door. And, so, you know, there goes our top secret facility. <laughs> Maybe one, one last question, okay? Well, was just one thing I was just reminded of one, one story that um, in our studio we had, uh, we had limited access to the studio. Not everybody from Apple could come. Um, we, we just were trying to limit the number of people that could come in and see what was going on. And, and when we first moved in, um, Shortly thereafter, I had a meeting with John Scully, and interestingly enough, someone forgot to put his name on the list. Um, and you talk about a pissed off executive who couldn't get into the front of the building because his badge wouldn't work. <laughs> that, that, that meeting didn't go very well, needless to say. I'm Stephen Keyes. I worked at Apple from the late 80s to the early 90s as an enterprise evangelist. Um, sort of an oxymoron at Apple, I believe. And I, I had come from a big insurance company in Boston as the Mac champion. And the only way I could do any enterprise-oriented work at Apple was to work from inside is and um, We had a few large corporate customers, but not many. And uh, I was just wondering, I, put, as an outsider and then later inside the company, felt a lot of frustration about Apple's s seeming unwillingness to, to provide any assistance to businesses, the mainframes or big networks or anything else. And I wondered whether you all had uh, any perspective on that from your design input. I, I, did, talk, I did work with one guy who, who fixed the box. Some people might remember the Apple line box that allowed the serial port to connect to a 3270 um, IBM cable. I just wondered whether you all had uh, any experience back in the design area? Uh, I'll, I'll go quickly, briefly. Uh, when the Lisa came out, it was by far uh, the most advanced technology aimed at, at Fortune 500 companies. And we all know that it didn't sell as well as the marketing people thought. Uh, and the reason, simplest reason that I've ever heard from that is no purchasing agent was ever fired for buying an IBM product. Didn't matter about the technology. So, uh, underestimation of the, the, the power of, of another corporation's name? Yeah, I think that holds consistent that it was an area there was a desire to get into, but I think, you know, one of the challenges when I was there was in many ways Apple was trying to do too much, you know, during that period. If you look at what happened, when I was there, I, I think we had, a, we had um, three um, desktop platforms, two notebook platforms, a line of printers, line of displays. I mean, probably in some total we at any time had 50 active products in the, in the line where if you, the, the number Apple has today, you can probably, a, a platforms, basic device, you can count on two hands. And I think Steve really came back and focused it. But what, what happened is there was just so many things going on, so many different ways to try and beat what was at that time the, the evil empire of the, uh, you know, Saddam Hussein up in uh, Seattle and the Republican Guard down in, in Oregon that, um, you know, as many places as you can and then all of a sudden the company began to realize we can't fight all these battles and that's one where, exactly as you said, where you looked at it and said the, the, the cost of entry may be just too high to get in.
Well, I happen to know that there were 23 different ROM images. There were multiple ways of delivering software, multiple different product lines. I sat down with Gil and I did the cross product and showed him there were 110,000 configurations. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought it was great, wasn't it? Just please give a round of applause. And for those who want to hear a little more about it, there was just, we just had the, the D conference. Uh, Kara Swisher and Walt Mossberg just had Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and interview them for about an hour. It's posted on the Internet. I watched over the weekend. It's really fascinating. So I highly recommend it. I have a couple of gifts for you guys. Jerry, Bob, Bill, please come up. Ooh. What? It's not an iPod? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So th thank you for coming tonight. Uh, don't forget to get your book on the way out if you haven't already and get it signed. Thank you very Beautiful much for coming and I hope to see you again.